Three's the magic number. We've got three streams and, and three technicians that are behind this presentation and really glad for the other contributors here. Dawn's the scientist and Scott's the coordinator and I'm the boat boy and record keeper. And we have, a, I think, a really nice summary of, of, uh, of scattered groups of sampling. <coughs> so the monitoring that we've done on th these three rivers over 20 years can lead us toward predicting something about their abundance, the fish's abundance, their size, and, and some indications of recruitment. The objective we have in our stocking program, our recovery efforts, are to get populations that are self-sustaining. And that can be uh, measured in a number of ways. It's easiest to say that they're just replacing themselves. All the more precise numbers uh, make it more complicated, but we've got, uh, we've got uh, an easy target called are there numbers coming back that are <coughs> from their own reproduction. And compliments to the other collaborating organizations, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, other hatchery folks in DEC and the St. Regis Tribe, and, and some of the utility studies have been really helpful for us to draw this together. Well, this is largely a geography uh, story here that I want to really make you familiar with the, the streams, and, and I'll be the tour guide on this geography trip with my hat here. So the 26 years I've been up in Region 6, starting with a big survey on the Oswegatchi, we caught no sturgeon and admired the places where they used to be and got some pictures folks shared with us of what they used to catch back in the 1960s. And I think there's an endpoint, a real threshold we've crossed here, uh, as I'll explain it more later, but when you do get this sufficient, substantive amount of recruitment, what do you do about it? Do you say we stocked enough? Do you just keep stocking? And the decision is in process. So the geography lesson starts. We've got the Canadian border, and uh, these three rivers are, I'm considering them on a west to east sequence. Maybe you can get them straight as we go along here. But the Oswegatchie to the west has another sub-basin with a, a lake, Black Lake, that gives us a very special habitat, uh, habitat space for sturgeon to grow, and it's had a historic uh, commercial catch, a very limited commercial catch, and a history of having sturgeon. And then the middle river, the Grass River, uh, having a smaller watershed, everything about it is smaller, with the exception to it having 28 miles of inhabitable reach. That's just where the dam is. They could swim further if this dam at Madrid were uh, of a different sort. And the river furthest to the east, the St. Regis, is an uh, intermediate-sized watershed with uh, 20 miles of, of habitat for sturgeon to carry on business. So a little bit of uh, countryside here. This is Elmdale Rapids, which is about a six-foot rapids with uh, this particularly low water. And when you're standing next to it at a high flow, it looks like sturgeon wouldn't even swim up over it. Uh, below it is a, a wonderfully scoured deep spot with lots of logs. And, and then it flattens out to a delta with sand. And it's, it's really a, a special spot in the Oswegatchie. The middle river, the, the grass, <coughs> being the smaller of watersheds is shallower and rock, bedrock uh, expanses are pretty obvious to you. A special thing about the grass I'll keep inserting here is it's not a river where we needed to do restoration work with stocking. It's had a sustained population over, over history. So quite an unusual place that overfishing didn't knock it off the scale. And then the third river with this upstream end, the St. Regis has a rapids at Brazier Falls that's an impressive Adirondack looking, kind of a classic uh, place for sturgeon to spawn. And below this, the next um, 20 miles is, is, is a typical lowland river with, with sandy curves and some deep scour spots. To look closer at the three, the Oswegatchie is going to be the majority of the remainder of my story here, but I want to go across the three for comparisons more. We can't say much about the Oswegatchie without having drawing from the knowledge we have from these others. That we have just a wealth of information from the, the three rivers combined. So Black Lake and Lower Oswegatchie are confluent with each other. Fish can swim back and forth. And if you put the two miles together, 25 miles of, of habitat with a very productive lake, higher growth rates and uh, 
tremendous food reserves, a shallow lake with uh, some deep spots. There's a 30-foot spot that's very special to several kinds of fish. And the other component of this, the middle Oswagachi, with an admirably long segment, 48 miles, between the natural barrier at uh, Natural Dam and the dam, the man-made dam at Hubleton, where fish go down and, as most dams are, they don't come back. They don't come back because they can't swim back without a fish weight. Um, it's a, a study feature that's given us lots of special knowledge, as you'll I'll get an idea here for as we go along. The Grass River, the middle of these three, again, has had no stocking. And you might say, what are we supposed to be recovering from? And there's habitat changes that uh, have, the dam has been removed at Messina. So maybe it's recovering from a constrained genetic diversity. But that's not even obvious. In the few years since the dam has gone out, it's been out for, since 1997, uh, 19 years. And we can't tell for sure that there's more sturgeon coming in there. There were quite a few sturgeon before, and there's still quite a few sturgeon in the Grass River. And then the third uh, up close geography of the St. Regis is it's uh, got the dam at Hogansburg. If you were able to jump around to different sessions, Tony David told how the dam was removed from Hogansburg. And this complicates our story of what our stocking might have achieved, but uh, it broadens the genetic diversity and the capacity of spawners to come from the Quebec side of the St. Lawrence and now to reach Brazier Falls, to mingle in with those which have been uh, exclusively from our stocking. So a brief crossing of the methods here, we stocked fish. We stocked them for um, the nine years here, and that's the basis of our, our study group that are growing older and and contentedly having maturity so that they can spawn. Just the two rivers that we stocked, just the Oswagachi system and the St. Regis. The other part of our, oh, I want to remind about how this, the Grass River has not had stocking and its uh, continued population characteristics are really valuable for us to compare to. So this uh, arithmetic here, I got thrown with the number seven indeed. It's, if anybody's checking me out, it's nine years here. And we've got a terrific group of fish out there, like Oneida Lake, in having uh, several years to grow older, and, and we're able to see how their maturity has advanced. Our other part of our methods is with the gill nets. We've used large mesh nets that we call sturgeon nets. The 10-inch mesh caught no sturgeon in it, so the 8-inch uh, tells us that there aren't many large fish out there. We continue to use the 10-inch, and then we uh, the catch that came from 8 inch was our larger fish catch. And we have experimental mesh nets, which are variable, uh, 4 inches, uh, 1 and a half to 4 inches, and they caught most of our sturgeon. And then the information we got from fishers, from the trot line runners from earlier, gave us invaluable information too, because the below detection that we have trouble with our sampling, uh, the fishermen out there, and they go even lower into the density that they know some fish are there, and they'll tell us about it got lots of good fishermen contacts. So into the results, they're easy to catch and they're particularly abundant. In our nets, we average about one fish per net, which is pretty gratifying. Uh, it's plenty of information to work with. Over the period of years, we've got hundreds of fish to have measurements and to compare the measurements. The strength of our analysis here is just how big are they? Are they big enough to have uh, spawned and done the task? And sturgeon are often caught in these stocked rivers in the St. Regis and Oswagachi in greater numbers and in greater frequency than any other kind of fish. So our stocking is not a, a dismally small number. We've changed the system so that those looking for the same foods that sturgeon are eating probably are noticing that there's something else grazing their, their favorite uh, invertebrates. Some of the numbers just to show you that we have hundreds of fish accumulated over these study years and complements to the different groups that have been going in. <clears throat> but we took only the most recent of these years to get further close-up looks at the size of, of the fish. And catch rates are an output here that we have a lot of variability. Often the lower catch rate is from the sturgeon nets, which just catch fewer fish, fewer sturgeon. And 
the higher catch rates are always from the variable mesh nets. So the variable mesh nets catch large sturgeon and small sturgeon. <coughs> the sturgeon nets just catch large sturgeon. It gives us a mixed cross-section of what's out there. And the same is applied to all three rivers. The Grass River study of 2007 and 2008 was funded by uh, Messina Electric and gave us a very solid piece of abundance information. They even have a population estimate. And then about the sizes, which I think is the strength of all of the numbers we have. If we start at the bottom and, and speak about how the Grass River might be an intact natural system with a few of the small fish, there were so, some yearlings here on the 200 millimeter length and then a few adults, but a majority of them in the 700 millimeter range. And that's just the way it is. We separated the different studies we have and they all came out with about the same curve for the Grass River. So it's not a fish a distribution that's all messed up because of stocking year classes. It's what, uh, what comes in to spawn from the lower river and what is there as, as residents. So I think there's two interacting groups of sturgeon, the residents and this migratory group. Then to go to the top where the Oswagachi is a real mixture of a story and I'll get to more about it later, but we have a strong representation of the, the recent stocking years just like the St. Regis of strong representation of the stocking of 2013, 14, 15, the majority of the fish from the stocking of those seven years. <coughs> and the closer look at the, same, at the Oswagachi shows how this upstream, or the middle Oswagachi, with the blue, has a very smaller end of the scale size distribution. We know that fish move downstream in the system after they're stocked. They go over the dam, they don't come back, so we're, we're losing the larger fish. Uh, there also might be a, a harvest component, an illegal harvest component, but we, we know that they're moving downstream. They show up below this dam at Hubleton. And the largest group of fish are in the gray or the black lake, which has the terrific growth rates. And the connecting water between the two, to the lower Oswagachi, which they can swim back and forth from black lake to the lower Oswagachi, has an intermediate size distribution. To look again, closer at the middle Oswagachi, where we have this sample data uh, particularly from 2016, but I've lumped it here with some samples from earlier. So uh, again, it's really on the smaller end of the scale with this group of, of uh, 200 millimeter fish being the most recently stopped. So it was a, a profound abundance of, of all sizes of fish to have they're more sturgeon than anything else, and particularly um, the experimental gill nets catch everything quite well. We had the before when we caught no sturgeon, and now we have these uh, substantial catch rates. And a close look at this 2016 catch in the Oswagachi, we did aging on this intermediate group that we're saying are between age 5 and 10, and this doesn't align to any of the years of stocking. So. The inference is that we've got wild fish, that we've got recruitment going on in this system, a large abundance of it, a large group of these 600 to 800 millimeter fish, and the aging we've had confirmed by other experts in New York for different examinations of these. Um, I had my, yeah, here the uh, Finray section, but this is a typical size, and some nets we'd catch three that just look like a trio indeed, and these would be the seven-year-olds that are the age class of 2009 when there was no stocking. So we analyze this in a very rudimentary way to say that we can back, we can subtract to so to say that they came from the year 2006 to 2011. The slow maturing females would not have been able to produce eggs in this time period, so where did the uh, females contributing to this come from? And we're just feeling that they're wild fish that have been below detection, and perhaps the males in this huge abundance of uh, males looking for females activated the females into a higher year class production, and we've got lots of fish. We can't lose in this uh, story the technical parts of it. We don't understand exactly who met up with who, and and what their long-term history was. Were they a wild strain to the Oswagachi that are mixing with our hatchery strain? But uh, we've got recruitment. That's what we went after, and it's profoundly abundant. 
So some conclusions are we, we met our objective back in 2005. We had a, an objective for this recovery program that said we need to get some more rivers with recruitment sufficient to carry them. And here we have five years of your classes, uh, well within the target range. If we try to speak about the lower Oswagachi and the Black Lake, it's a less clear picture because there's a number of other factors moving in. They're inheriting fish from the middle segment, and they grow faster, and they pass through this intermediate size range without us having any uh, large-scale studies. If we went out and captured a large number of those that were 800 to 1,000 millimeters and, and, back and did the aging, we'd probably confirm it. But we caught fish in this segment spawning, and it's likely that there's uh, recruitment there as well. For the St. Regis, we have a later stocking scenario so that the females would be much younger there, and we have, no, we have uh, knowledge that there are no other sturgeon there, so there's no below detection group that will help out in that way. Uh, bringing to an end here the acknowledgments of all of these other groups, we sure wouldn't have gotten this far down the road without the other studies, and of course the hatcheries are essential part of the recovery efforts with the Federal Hatchery in Genoa, Wisconsin being a continuing contributor to help with the other elements as you can see here. And Scott Schluter had an early study in 1998 and 99 that really was a boost to this whole recovery program. It, stocking had been underway for five years and uh, gave us uh, a, a good comparison this many years later to say that the abundance is similar or the differences that we detected here. So uh, that rounds us up. We've got a couple, uh, couple minutes for questions. So this is dropping the, the study results on a scientific group that should be able to sit back and say, I don't believe one bit of it. <laughs> or, this is, this is uh, un unprecedented to me that we can advocate that we actually back away from a stocking program because we have reached the goal, at least for this Oswagachi component, which we're glad to see.